Good morning and welcome to worship. We are delighted to share this time of prayer and praise with you. Worship for July is here at Trinity at 10 a.m. and available on our live stream either in real time or later as a recording. For August, we will move to Atwood United Church at 10 a.m. Recordings in August of the sermon will be available starting sometime Sunday afternoon on our YouTube channel, as we don't have live streaming equipment in Atwood. Throughout the summer, there are worksheets to go with each service's theme. For those who are interested, we hope you grabbed one on your way in today or picked one up through one of our social media channels if you are worshiping with us at home. Some people concentrate better while writing or drawing, so feel free to doodle during the service or take it home if you prefer. Drop the pens in the bin at the front here on your way out. Even as we move into step three of the Reopen Ontario plan, we ask for your continued cooperation for everyone who is attending the church building in person. Please self-screen before coming, wear a mask at all times in the building, and keep physical distancing with anyone not in your household, both inside the building and out in our parking areas. One of the differences you will notice to our worship service is the return of responsive spoken calls to worship and prayers. Please feel free to join in. Congregational singing indoors is still strongly discouraged, so we will have to wait a little longer for that. But with continued care and increasing vaccination, I am hopeful that we will soon be able to do that again. We are also now able to serve food and drink with precautions outside. And so we are going to have refreshments after worship to next Sunday in the Peace Garden, which is just outside here, after the service. So as you're planning your Sunday for next week, please allow a little bit of extra time um, so that you can join us, weather permitting, for that after worship here on our last Sunday in Listowel. You're also invited to join us on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. in the Peace Garden at Trinity or Thursdays at 2 p.m. in the park in Atwood. The Listable gathering is canceled in the event of rain, but Atwood's precedes rain or shine. Coming up this afternoon, there is a car rally that starts at the Presbyterian Church in Atwood at 2 p.m. It's a family-friendly event for all ages and will wind up by 5 p.m. at the United Church in Atwood. And so anyone who's interested is most welcome to join us for that exciting event. It's part of a reimagined VBS program. Um, so we have also have take-home kits for kids. And then Friday, Friday night, there'll be a free drive-in movie at Atwood Presbyterian Church at dusk around 9 p.m. We're gonna watch the movie, The Incredibles on the side of the building. They have an FM transmitter. So just bring your car full of people and come and enjoy that. And again, everyone is welcome. Also a reminder, we have a couple of meetings coming up this week. So on Wednesday evening at seven, the Trinity Council will meet on Zoom um, and the Atwood official board will meet at seven on Thursday at the Lions Park Pavilion. So if you're in the Atwood board, please bring a lawn chair um, and please get any agenda items to Keith for Trinity or to Becky for Atwood or to both of them if you want it considered by both churches. Today, we have a story about how God doesn't want to be pinned down, but rather travels with the people in tents wherever they go. As we hear this story, let us remember that the Creator did not arrive in this land when European colonists came to build homes and churches. God's presence filled this land since time immemorial, and the holy and sacred mysteries of life were understood in ways that were deep and meaningful by the Chippewa, Hadassani and Ashinaabek peoples who occupied this place before us. Let us gather with humility and respect, remembering that our Christian tradition is merely one way of engaging with a divine presence in the world. Light is everywhere this time of year with long days and warm sunshine. The flame of the Christ candle reminds us of the beauty and presence of light that paints the sky, warms the land, brings growth to fields and forests, and brightens our path. Thanks be to the Creator for fire and sun, for flame and fuel, and for the light of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Let us listen to our opening music. Please join me in our call to worship. When I think of God's presence in the world, I am grateful. And when I think of God's presence in my life, I am humbled. And when I think of God's presence in the community, I am glad. Thank you all. Thank you, God. Let us pray. God of the open road, God of the twisting path, God of the uncertain way, your people come together for worship. As we journey with you, give us courage and faith and compassion and endurance to face any hardship. Open our eyes to see you walking beside us, protecting us, encouraging us, loving us. Amen. And we'll listen to our first hymn. Let us continue in prayer together. God, spare us from comfort that would sedate us, from certainty that would numb us, from peace that hides from the world's grief, from security that keeps us from daring to journey with you.
Let's share this good news. No matter where we are, no matter what we have done, no matter where life takes us, may our assurance be grounded not in places or in events, but in the deep love of God which invites us to live in fullness and hope, today and always. Amen. And we'll listen. Since Europeans arrived in this land, we have been building church buildings as a sacred space to worship God. At the same time, we outlawed many of the traditional practices of indigenous peoples who were here before us and prevented them from building or rebuilding sacred spaces for their own worship practices. One example is the potlatch, a gift-giving feast common in many Pacific Coast peoples which was outlawed in Canada from 1884 to 1951, with a minimum two-month jail sentence for anyone caught participating in one. The Haltzik people are seeking to reclaim this practice by building a traditional longhouse. Let's watch a video they produced talking about this process. After decades and generations of dreaming and planning and fundraising, we are building a big house in Balabella. We are watching the beams go up, we are watching the roof go on, and we're watching that dream come to life. The big house is a sacred place. The big house is a place where our ancestors come down from the spirit world and they, they are, are among us and we, are, we move between worlds during a potlatch. And the big house is a place that is, is for health sick. It's, it's a health sick place. It makes it so much more than a building when you're really intimate with every beam and every board in it. When you know who, who felled the tree, who drove that tree on a truck to the water, who barged it to Bella Bella, who milled it into the lumber for the big house, and then who put that beam or that board up. When you know the origin of, of all of the wood and all of the people who were involved in that whole chain of custody that led to it going from a tree to a big house, it just gives it so much more meaning. I've worked in the field for many years and I'm learning like every step of the way on this build, I'm learning something new every day. Especially with the group of workers that we have here. We got Leroy, we have Marcel, we have Jerry, we have Danny, and we have the local guys working here and everybody's such a good team when we work together and we're all learning, we're all benefiting from this build and it's just amazing to be a part of this team. So the vision of Tribal Council in this very proud and large project was to also find a way to invest in capacity development and increase our skill set on the ground so that as we move forward with other infrastructure projects, uh, we actually have local health sick people who can take a part in the lead of that. And so the legacy that uh, we, we hope to leave um, this leave behind after we're finished this project is that you know maybe a few people have defined themselves by 
being builders. It's such an honor to be part of this uh, big house. It really up, uplifts me when you see an elder come in and look around and see the big smiles. It's Heltic's first big house in over 100 years, so it's extremely exciting for an exciting time for our people. Um, you know, just being able to bring kind of the culture back after having it ripped away from us is really, really significant. I mean, I, I think for me the most exciting thing about the big house uh, being so close to being finished is it's just such a clear symbol of us reclaiming our strength. There have been generations and generations of uh, assaults on our, our culture, our language, our identity as Helsinki people. And this big house is an emblem that says we're still here and we're proud of who we are. Now let us listen to a story from our faith tradition. Reading from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 to 13. When the king was settled in his palace and God had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to the prophet Nathan, Look, I'm living in a cedar palace, but God's chest is housed in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go ahead and do whatever you are thinking, because God is with you. But that very night God spoke to Nathan, Go to my servant David and tell him, This is what God says. You are not the one to build the temple for me to live in. In fact, I haven't lived in a temple from the day I brought Israel out of Egypt until now. Instead, I've been traveling around in a tent and in a dwelling. Throughout my traveling around with the Israelites, did I ever ask any of Israel's tribal leaders I appointed to shepherd my people, why haven't you built me a cedar temple? So then say this to my servant David, this is what the Almighty God says. I took you from the pasture, from following the flock, to be leader over my people Israel. I've been with you wherever you've gone, and I've eliminated all your enemies before you. Now I will make your, your name great, like the name of the greatest people on earth. I'm going to provide a place for my people Israel and plant them so that they may live there and no longer be disturbed. Cruel people will no longer trouble them as they have been earlier, when I appointed leaders over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. And God declares to you that God will make a dynasty for you. When the time comes for you to die and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your descendant, one of your very own children, to succeed you, and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a temple for my name, and I will establish his royal throne forever. May God inspire us to courageous living today through this story of our faith tradition. Amen. Please join me in our responsive psalm. Your love, God, is my song and I'll sing it. I'll never quit telling the story of your love, how you built the cosmos and guaranteed everything in it. Blessed be God forever and always. Amen. The impulse to build structures for the worship of God is ancient. The megalithic temples in Malta are the oldest freestanding structures in the world, and they date back to between 3600 and 3700 BC. They are older than the pyramids or Stonehenge. We don't know very much about these temples, but statues of a goddess which was commonly worshipped in the ancient Mediterranean region have been found on Malta and other nearby islands. Evidence of animal sacrifices and sophisticated decoration have also been found in these Maltese temples. The people who built them left no written records and disappeared between 2500 and 2000 BC, probably due to deforestation which destroyed the agricultural fertility of the island for many years. As a result, there are many mysteries about the life of the people who created these extraordinary places of worship. Still, 
most archaeologists are agreed that worship was the purpose of these remarkable ancient structures. Fast forward 2,500 years to about the year 1000 BC, and we find King David of biblical fame in our Bible story this morning. David was the youngest son of a, of a shepherd named Jesse. The prophet Samuel searches him out while he's still a young boy and anoints him to be king. Even though there already is a king, King Saul, and youngest sons were not usually the choice for important roles. Then David, the scrawny shepherd boy, famously defeats the giant Goliath using his slingshot and is taken into the court of King Saul. David becomes a master musician and a close friend of Saul's son, Jonathan. However, King Saul becomes jealous of David's popularity and turns against David, so David must flee. To oversimplify a more complex story, later Saul and Jonathan are both killed and David is crowned king of Israel and Judah. When the newly crowned King David settles down in Jerusalem, he has a palace built for himself and his seven, soon to become eight, wives and children. And now King David wants to build a temple for the worship of God that will be home for the Israelites' most sacred treasure, the Ark of the Covenant. Up until this time, the sacred tablets on which the Ten Commandments are inscribed have been carried around with the people wherever they go, in a gold-covered wooden chest called the Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of God. As the people of Israel travel th through the desert for 40 years after fleeing Egypt, the Ark went with them, housed in a special tent called the Tabernacle that was set up every time they made camp. The Ark led the way when Joshua brought the people out of the desert into their new homeland after the death of Moses. The Israelites took it into battle with them many times against the current inhabitants of the land they were conquering. One time they lost the battle and the Ark was taken by the Philistines, but bad things happened wherever the Philistines took the Ark, so they eventually decided to give it back. Now that he's firmly established himself as king, David wants to build a permanent home for the Ark of the Covenant, a temple befitting his God. And at first, the prophet Nathan gives him the go ahead, but then Nathan has a vision from God. Nathan tells David that he should not build a temple because God is happy in the tent. God has gone with him wherever he has gone. God does not need a building of cedar. So David is forbidden to build a temple, although he has promised that his successor as king will be one of his own sons who will be able to complete this work that he must leave undone. I find this an apt reminder that none of us will ever complete everything we might wish to in our lives, and that sometimes we cause suffering by striving too hard. As Amelia Burr puts it in her poem, Because I Have Loved Life, I give a share of my soul to the world where my course is run. I know another shall finish the task I must leave undone. King David doesn't get to finish everything. He must leave this task for his son, King Solomon. And it's okay, good even, to leave some things for others to complete. It is also possible that King David's motives in wanting to build the temple might have something to do with why God says no. Did David want to build the temple for the glory of God or in order to consolidate his power? Was David's motive really concerned that he has a nice home and God is living in a tent? We know from other stories about King David, such as the story of David and Bathsheba and Uriah, which comes soon after this one in the book of 2 Samuel, that King David was not above using people and things for his own purposes. Could he be trying to use building a temple as a symbol to expand his own power? However, what I find most intriguing about this story at this moment in time is the emphasis on the value of God residing in a tent, not a building. God, who is in a tent, can go with the people wherever life takes them. 
God who is in a tent is flexible, movable, changeable, yet always present. And over the past 18 months, we have needed to be flexible, movable, and changeable. Over the past 18 months, we have had to develop our ability to notice God outside our church buildings. You may have seen an internet meme that talked about the relative of importance of various things before and during COVID. Relative importance of home internet, sharp increase. Relative importance of coffee, equal or slight increase. Relative importance of dress pants, sharp decrease. Relative importance of your car, slight decrease, and so on. And while none of the memes I saw included it, I think you could add relative importance of church building, buildings to the ministry of God's people, sharp decrease. You see, virtually all our ministry over the past year and a half has taken place outside of buildings. We have had to put God back in a tent. One moment that stands out for me of taking worship to the people occurred during Advent. This past Advent, we were worshiping online, but having families record the lighting of the Advent candles during the week from the church building here so that we could show it on Sunday morning. It was nice to see the familiar wreath and the familiar space on Zoom and YouTube. However, one week, the family who were scheduled to light the candles could no longer do it because one of the members of the family was, a, was in a school class that had been asked to isolate, which meant they couldn't come to the church building. So an inspired worship committee member quickly organized outdoor drop-off and pick-up of the Advent wreath at their home so the family could light the candles there and text me the video. Rather than them coming to the wreath, the wreath came to them. This past year and a half has required us to make lots of changes to the life of the church. And that has been definitely challenging at times. And there are many aspects of pre-COVID church life that many of us miss. Yet if we have learned one thing, it might be the deep truth that this story points to. God can still be God in a tent. God does not require us to be able to enter our church buildings to know that God is with God's people. God goes with us wherever we are. In fact, God does not want to be confined to our buildings. God's best work is done elsewhere. Of course, this doesn't mean that buildings are unimportant. As we saw in the video about the construction of the Heltzik Big House, sacred spaces can contribute to the spiritual well-being of communities. Denying the First Nations of this country the right to have sacred buildings if they so chose was a grievous wrong. So too is the vandalism this week at Kareem Mosque in Cambridge. Asif Khan said in a news release following the vandalism, our mosques have always served as symbols of peace in the community, and it is hurtful for us to see our mosques attacked and vandalized in this fashion. And to a much smaller degree, we've experienced that with our sign that says, we value diversity, which periodically seems to get damaged and has to be replaced, proving the importance of the sign, because if someone is resistant enough to it to damage it, that's why we need it in our community. Sacred spaces of all faith traditions, including our own, remind us of God's presence, connect us with our ancestors and our traditions, and are symbols of faith and peace in our communities. At their best, you walk into a place of worship and you know you are standing on holy ground. You feel the power of sanctuary. Nevertheless, God cannot be contained by our buildings. God does not require our buildings. The church would still be the church even if we were never able to set foot in a church building again. We must never forget that before the universe began, before there were human beings to praise God, before there was a temple in Jerusalem, God was in the midst of it all. And if we can remember this, then we can keep the value of our church buildings in its proper perspective. 
as a tool for the worship of God and service in our communities, not as something to be worshipped in their own right. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our minute for mission today is about Alf Dumont. When Alf Dumont's Roman Catholic father and Anishinaabe mother asked the priests serving in Shawanaga Reserve to marry them, the priests rejected the request, advising them to marry someone of their own kind. Nearby, a United Church minister had a different response. He told the couple he had just two rules. If you have differences, talk them out and just try to get along. Dad and Mom said, I think we can do that. They brought together First Nations understanding and non-First Nations understanding. That's how I came to the church, Dumont recounts in his United in Learning webinar. Dumont spent his life as a spiritual leader, serving the United Church as a minister, while staying connected with his traditional Indigenous spirituality. His memoir, The Other Side of the River, From Church Pew to Sweat Lodge, share stories of how Dumont walks between two worlds of Indigenous and settler, traditional spirituality and Christianity. Part of the struggle with me in life was to find out who I was as Anishinaabe and who I was as French, Irish, and English mix, Dumont shares. With a foot in both sides of the river, Dumont's words eloquently draw together spiritual threads. There are seven truths in some of the Anishinaabe teaching Love, courage, respect, humility, truth, wisdom, and honesty. But you can't have one of these teachings or truths without having the other. So you can't have respect without love. You can't have truth without humility, explains Dumont. I took those underlying teachings and applied them to the four teachings on love. Love God, love your neighbor, love your enemy, love yourself. You can't have one teaching without the other. You can't love God if you don't try to love yourself. You can't love your neighbor unless you truly love God. In an interview, Broadview magazine asked Dumont to weigh in on the future of reconciliation. Part of the struggle has to do with learning to walk together again. It means being as open as we can, he says. You bring a gift that I don't have. I bring a gift that you may not have. And as we share, we learn from the gifts that we have been given. Your gifts through the Mission and Service Fund help support the creation and publication of luminous, timely work like Dumont's book, as well as webinar discussions and education events that follow. Through listening and learning, we take important steps forward on the journey of reconciliation. We make our offering to God in many ways. We offer our resources for the shared work of the community. We offer our time and energy that love and justice might grow in the world. We offer our own particular talents that we might contribute to abundance for all. As we consider all the ways in which we make our offerings, let us pray. God of tent and temple, forest and field, you are always moving, always calling us to come along with you into unexpected and wonderful places. May the gifts of money we give here and through our bank accounts help your church to be dynamic and fluid, responding creatively to the needs of our community and the world. Amen. And we listen.
Let us pray. God of the journey, we celebrate today all the startling ways. <laughs> you, you, you heard the cue, right? Startling. <laughs> God of the journey, we celebrate today all the startling ways in which we sense your presence. In the depths of our hearts, in the face of a stranger, in the smile of a friend, in the care of a loved one, in the stories on the news, and in the community of people gathered to worship, whether in person or through technology. As we continue our journey with you, help us to reveal your love in action. May our words always be rooted in compassion. May our choices help love and justice to grow in the world. May our lives be lived with integrity and courage. We give thanks for this time of worship, which helps us to pause, to rest in your presence, to pray and to reflect on our lives in faith. We long for holy space. We long for sacred stillness. We pray for respite and refocusing. We need to stand in your grace and become grounded and centered in your way, your vision, your promise. Renewed by our time of worship, send us out to listen to the lost and lonely, to learn from the broken and poured out, to address the fear and sense of quiet desperation, to name evil and societal sin, to offer hope and healing and hospitality. In particular this day, we pray for the many places and people in our lives and in the world who are struggling. We pray for all those impacted by natural disasters, remembering those affected by the tornado in Barrie, by flooding in Germany and Belgium after record rainfall there, by forest fires in Northern Ontario and Western Canada, by drought on the prairies. We pray for those impacted by political strife, conflict or uncertainty, remembering the people of South Africa, of Haiti, of Ethiopia, of Cuba. We pray for places where COVID is increasing or health systems are struggling, remembering Indonesia, Japan, Argentina, South Africa, Thailand, El Salvador, South Korea, Malaysia, Tunisia, a portage fishing, fishing vessel off the coast of Newfoundland, Gray Bruce Health Unit, and others. We pray for those who encounter oppression, prejudice, and discrimination, remembering Indigenous peoples as they continue to, to grieve the discoveries of unmarked graves and recent comments by politicians and others. Muslims in Canada who are fearful because of vandalism at a Cambridge mosque just a short time after the murder of four people in London. Healthcare workers who have been threatened for their stance on COVID-19 precautions and vaccinations, especially those who are people of color who have been especially targeted. We pray for those who are coping with health challenges, grieving the loss of loved ones, struggling with difficult choices, living with painful uncertainty, and much more. Adding now in a moment of shared silence, those concerns and people who are close to our hearts this day. God of our hearts, help us to be part of your answer to the pain of the world and sustain us as we strive to walk in your way. We ask all this as followers of Jesus who share the prayer of the church in his name. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now let's listen to a hymn.
as we prepare to leave this house of worship and this time of prayer. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of God's hand. And we have closing music. this candle, we go forth as a spirit-led people, taking the light of Christ which brings warmth and growth into every aspect of our daily living. Amen. Mm -hmm.